Thank you for listening to SPN, the Savage Podcasting Network. You're listening to the Stephen Savage Show on the Savage Podcasting Network. And now here's your host, film and television director, Stephen Savage. Thank you, Andrea, and welcome everyone to yet another episode of the Stephen Savage Show, the official podcast of the Idlewild International Festival of Cinema, which just completed its 14th season with a hugely successful event, a slew of filmmakers from all around the world attending and culminating in our annual ID Award ceremony where some very deserving independent films and filmmakers were honored, including the three that I have on the podcast today. Uh, This is the third part of a series with IIFC uh, Spotlight Directors, the the first on today's show being Joanna Putnam, who took home a few awards, I think, for her film Shutterbugs, including Best Director for a Feature Film, only the second such win by a woman in our 14-year history. Um, We also have the awesome Mo Irvin, who was awarded the best screenplay for a short film for his very off-the-wall movie, Mad Chicken. And last but not least, I get to interview uh, the filmmakers of the documentary Being Michelle, which took away a couple of awards, uh, including the Humanitarian Award for uh, Documentary Filmmaking. And just a reminder, we're coming to you, as always, from Cranium Wheel Studios in beautiful Idlewild, California, just two hours east of Los Angeles, but a world away at nearly 6,000 feet, high atop Mount San Jacinto and overlooking the great Coachella Valley. And uh, just to let you know, all of these interviews today took place uh, the week prior to the festival. So, without further ado, let's get the ball rolling on part two of our IIFC Spotlight Director Series for 2023. And with me now is another of our Idlewild 2023 Spotlight Directors, who's bringing to IIFC a very cool feature film entitled Shutterbugs. And my interest was piqued by the storyline of this film because it's it's sort of similar uh, a similar death in the family type situation as I created for my 2014 film Vertical. And you know, any storyteller will who's gone through this kind of life changing event always has a screenplay in them uh, illuminating those issues. And this one is very much one of those crossroads of life narratives that I'm very that I'm drawn to in film. So anyway, here is the director and writer of Shutterbugs, Miss Johanna Putnam. Johanna, I hope I got that right. <laughs> Thanks for coming on today. You did it indeed. Thank you so much for having me, Stephen. We're so excited for Idlewild. Oh, great. I'm glad to hear that. And I really love the film. And it's a pretty movie on top of everything else. And I know that, you know, as the as the writer, the um, the beginnings of this uh, of the film came from straight out of your head. So um, it, it was a bit touch and go getting you on because you're right in the middle of another fe- film festival, correct? Yes, we are. We're at Oxford Film Festival in Oxford, Mississippi. Sweet. Uh, we're screening tomorrow. We're having a blast. It's our third festival, and we're, <laughs> we're going to Durango after this, and then we're hopping over to Idlewell for a whole week. So oh, we're going to be there for, from start to finish at the fest there. That's great. Fantastic, because I want to... I have a every year I have an invitation only kind of director's mixer thing and I want to definitely invite you to it. I want to talk about the film probably more than we'll have a chance to talk about just in the regular festivities, but well yeah, we'll have a chance to talk. So, but I would love to. Before we get into the film, let's give my listeners a bit of background on you as a filmmaker, your education, etc. If you don't mind, just give us a little bit of what brought you to uh filmmaking in the first place. Absolutely. So, I um I studied film theory and criticism at Dartmouth College, um, mm-hmm. I was very interested in acting. Mm-hmm. But I remember I'd grown up just you know with with parents who were always showing me films and kind of being in like a cinephiliac household. But right. I do remember being in my first film studies class in one of those little cubicles in the viewing rooms mm-hmm. and watching like Lars von Trier breaking the waves for the first time, and right. then and just weeping, just audibly wailing <laughs> in the middle of the library, yeah. and then going to Sundance that year and sitting through like I think it was Margot Zadosmowska's Oh No, Stranger. Um, which just spoke this like psychological character study, like language that I just I'd never seen before. And just mm-hmm. knowing, okay, I do want to act and I do love cinema as a medium, but like, boy, I, I would love to get my hand in other elements of it as well. Right. Yeah. And um, I got out of college and I went straight to LA. Uh, I didn't go to film school. I thought I would just 
do that really aspirational <laughs> but illogical thing of just being really smart and hustling really hard and getting right. on the best independent film sets that there were. Yep. But that's not really how that world works. So I played a scream queen <laughs> in a bunch of bad horror films. I died like 15 deaths, you know, by knife and sword and, and monster. And uh, I learned a ton about being on set, but right. I was still not really in power. You know, I wasn't really empowered by, by the opportunities there. You know, I was kind of begging for jobs as, a, as an actress and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going anywhere with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't into, and I just didn't really imagine that I had the community or the resources around me to just go make my own thing. Right. So I was writing scripts and I was like spinning ideas and I was loving film all the time, but yeah. I didn't know how to make my own, my own voice and vision happen. And then, uh, you know, pandemic hit. Yeah. Um, I'm in New York City. Um, I hop up to my parents' house just to kind of escape the chaos. And I'm there with my partner who's the first AD. Mm -hmm. And uh, we woke up one day and I was like, you know what? Like we've talked about collaborating a lot. And we have all this time, and we have this beautiful landscape. And I'm going to write a script while you learn how to use a cinema camera. Uh -huh. and that's where it all started. And then we got our, our third best friend up, Jamie Unruh, who's an editor. We got her off as a, as a third set of hands and, and minds and hearts. And we made this thing with a cast crew and team of three people, which yeah. was... Um, that's the best. Yeah, it was a beast. <laughs> I always tell everybody I went to film school, but you know what? I learned more on my first feature <laughs> film than I did with all the thousands I spent on oh, film yeah, school. Oh, yeah, especially if you're wearing like 12 to 15 hats all on your own. You can learn the most. <laughs> That's right. You know, it sounds like you and I had similar backgrounds. I mean, I in the days before VCRs, <laughs> I used to – my mom would let me get up in the middle of the night. I Even on school nights, I'd set alarms and I'd get up to watch movies, you know, like Sergio Leone or whatever was on. Oh, yeah. at two in yeah. the morning and I realize now looking back I was studying film even though I wasn't you know I didn't Absolutely. I wouldn't have called it I remember seeing I, mess, yeah, I yeah. remember seeing crane shots that that became establishing shots and little things like that and I had no idea what I was looking at but I'd go that's awesome what is that you know? <laughs> yeah yeah and how, and how did they do that what does that mean because I know how it makes me feel and I know that yeah. I want to do that too yeah. I remember in LA, I was like in a miserable state of, of time there. And there, when there were still video stores, I could go into the video store around the corner and the Criterion Collection was an, an aisle. Right. And I just spent, I spent a few years just watching everything from Criterion and be yeah. like, God, yeah, that makes sense to me. That's, that's the language I want to teach. Yeah, some of, sometimes film school starts for people much earlier than they even realize that it is. You know, it's, a, it's kind of yeah. a cool thing, you know. It's, uh, but, um, you know, Tarantino never went to film school and <laughs> so was nothing wrong with that um it's funny you said you did a lot of screen sque screen queen roles and I've had actors I wrote a couple and just sold them early on I've never directed one but one of those yeah. like horror things and I've had actors and actresses especially come up to me and go I did one of your movies and I what are you <laughs> I had no idea oh that's so funny yeah and, well, just... and, don't, and don't get me wrong like I learned so much from yep. those too like I worked with the with the Gulagers who are just some of the uh, most Right. like independent and falls right. out like artistic like people that, that have ever made movies in, in this town and like I was so grateful to be on their sets and yeah, it just you know it inspired by wanting to find my own you know vision from that too but yeah. like it, it was it was just you know it, it still wasn't it wasn't creating the opportunities that I was hoping that it would so sure, at some yeah. point I was going to have to take the reins but in hindsight yeah you look back and go wow I did learn a lot from that but and I'm finding yeah. I'm finding that I've I'm meeting a lot of, especially actresses, especially female actors who are saying that they've started directing and producing just because they're not, they're just tired of getting crap roles or offered to them or just not getting anything sent to them. And they just say, I'll do it myself. And I think it's a, oh, absolutely. It's a cool place to be in, you know, where we're at right now in, in history where we can. Obviously, you know, when with the advent of HD and really good cameras, you can pretty much make a movie that looks pretty decent. But you, as you know, you still have to write a good script. You still have to know how to light it. You know, you know how the you yep. have to have an edit. So in the yeah. beginning, everybody says, oh, the technology is going to mean there's so much crappy film out there. Well, yeah, there probably is. But those films aren't getting into film festivals. It's quality, you know, that that cream rises to the top. So, so yeah. We, Speaking of cream rising to the top, let's talk about Shutterbox now because that's uh, sure. one of our cream of the crop films this year. I'm not uh, too sh ashamed to say. Uh, give us the beginnings of that project and, in, and as we said earlier, the the script idea that how that came to you, and then uh, just the, the 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 overall you know shaking of the gold the uh, uh, snow globe and and making the project happen. Sure. So yeah, like I said, we uh, I well, you know I woke up one day and I just mm -hmm. proposed this idea. 
Um, and I, my job as been writing the script was to say, okay, what do we have around us that we can tell a story from? Mm-hmm. So like you, I am very drawn to, you know, uh, emotional stories of, mm-hmm. of grief and loss and the strange way that we as humans, you know, cope with some of the hardest moments. So mm-hmm. that was kind of a theme I wanted to introduce, especially because we were sitting in the middle of a pandemic. I'm right. in isolation with my parents, whose livelihood I'm terrified of every day. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, right. we're in an incredibly precarious moment, so right. it felt accessible, it felt um, appropriate, and it felt valuable for me to try to tell a story from there. Mm-hmm. And then I look around me, and I've got my childhood home, just chock full of beautiful production design, mm-hmm. so many memories, mm-hmm. so much personality, and then a landscape around it, just crumbling farmsteads, mm-hmm. a broken-down, half-burned, haunted house next door, right. just em- empty, gorgeous New York summer swell. Like the bugs and then the sunsets. I mean, everything about it was just, you yeah. know, I love psychological character studies and I love um, film that just really embraces all the sensory and aesthetic details of like the medium, you know, when, when, when sounds are just, they're, they're overwhelming and then when visuals are, are, are oh, jarring yeah. and we're, we're suddenly in the perspective of somebody else's version of reality. It's That's funny how location, how so, location, it's funny yeah. how locations can inspire us, you know, and all of a sudden, yeah. Totally. So. Well, and I didn't have access to actors, so I uh-huh. was going to have to write a story that where the, the environment was a character, right. the landscape yeah. was a character. Oh, so that's cool. I was, uh, you know, a woman comes home after her mom passes, and she gets to her childhood home, and she's isolated there, and things are off. Yeah, things are, are are wrong, and she feels that, and she can't explain it. And I wanted it to be an exploration of maybe you know the, the strange ways that we wrestle with grief and loss and mm-hmm. and memory and and childhood and. Um, that's kind of where it was all, all started. Um, my partner, Brendan Brooks, is uh, he's a first AD professionally, mm-hmm. but he was the one who I assigned. You know, He's been behind a monitor and a camera um, for so many years, and he has such a good eye for composition. And his job was to figure out what cinema camera he could learn to use, mm-hmm. which lenses he wanted, all that. Right. So as he is preparing for that, I also told him, you know, we need another character in this film, so you're going to have to be the creepy neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, I'll do it, but you're going to have to write me as small a role as possible. Uh, right. And I, t- I told my mom she was going to have to be in some of these flashback sequences as, as the mom that right. was portrayed in the film. Right. And, uh, you know, that, that's the point at which Jamie was like, okay, so when you and Brendan are both in the same scene, who's going to shoot it? And I was like, oh, my dad? <laughs> like, <laughs> and Jamie's like, I'm coming up there. I love this script. I'm going to like you do all the other jobs on set for you guys as well. Oh, that's great. So it, be, it became our three person team. And then we, we spent um, we spent so much time shot listing uh-huh. because we didn't quite know what we could pull off. We're like, right. okay, so Brennan's going to use a, a C200, a Canon C200. He's going to work at prime art lenses. We're going to do raw light so that if we over or underexpose, we have more flexibility. Mm-hmm. Um, but we don't know if he can pull focus like on a long lens, which oh, is what right. we're trying to aesthetically achieve. Ah. So we had we had kind of two different shot lists. One was the most ambitious, like if Brennan is the perfect <laughs> epic, like first time uh, cinematographer, this uh-huh. is what we can do. Uh-huh. But if not, here's a really cool way to achieve the same kind of intentions and aesthetic and 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 uh, just intentionality. So it, we we spent six weeks shot listing and we spent a ton of time preparing for our rental because basically we shot this film at the cost of our rental. Right. And yeah. when the gear got here, we uh, started playing with it and we we made sure that we could do what we wanted to do and we started shooting it and um, we started with a very strict schedule of 28 days which is long for a feature but (laughs) we had a lot to do right and then we realized like day two we're scrambling and i'm like wait a second like who are we beholden to we don't have an executive producer it's Mm -hmm. our money Mm -hmm. we can extend our rental let's take our time and really do this in, in a way where we can learn as much as we possibly can and capture exactly what we want right and that's and that's how we kind of operated from there we were we would powwow every evening, making sure we got what we wanted, you know, uh, incorporating the new magic moments into how we wanted to adapt it from there. But the three of us just, we, we had our hands in every part of the process and we understood the aesthetic and the, um, just the journey so well that, that it was a really fluid, tiny team, mm-hmm. but we were able to, to accomplish everything we wanted. We didn't sacrifice a shot. So I'm really proud of that. Yeah, that's the thing about shooting quick um just shooting independent film the smaller it's it's tough sometimes but the smaller you can keep your crew the better because it actually behooves you and it helps you to move faster even though you're saying i'm taking my time but at the same time you can still with a smaller crew who's all thinking at the same time and and this person's thinking even before you think and you guys are all in sync it works really well a lot of times yeah, it was glorious. It'll never kind of get as good as that. I mean, we definitely could have used some extra hands, but it was, you know, making a film with your best friends, you know, and your parents. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's never going to be quite that again. It was yeah. great. 
Well, <laughs> you know, my parents had no idea what a film set is like <laughs> in their home, okay? Well, they so, like, they, they see the equipment, like, arrive in the FedEx truck and put in a barn. Yeah. And then they're like, wait, that's coming inside? And then it comes inside, and then there's the concept of continuity. Yeah. So it's like, Mom, you can't take a piece out of that fruit bowl uh, for a week. <laughs> and she's like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's fun when you find yourself teaching film to people who have never asked you to learn about film, but you need them to yeah. answer. Like, I'm putting you through film school, even though you've never asked for this. So what's next for the movie? Do you have, you guys have distribution yet? Are you shopping it around or what? We are. I mean, we, so we were kind of spent a year just um, getting rejected from like, you know, really understanding what this process was because although we've all been in the industry we've never taken on the uh, producer roles right so we you know we started our our world premiere was in november and since then we've just been trying to approach as many festivals as we can we're so excited to come to idle wild like oh, that was great. at the top of our list and and it's gonna and it because we just know it's a filmmakers festival and that mm-hmm. our, our main goal honestly because we were a super micro budget film was to meet as many filmmakers as we can, mm-hmm. share our film, and just kind of create a footprint as new filmmakers and, and find future collaborators and get inspired. And that, all that's happening, but we are wrapping our heads now around, yeah, distribution of sales. We have, we have nothing at the moment. We're, we're taking meetings. We're sharing the film where we can. We're trying to be smart about that. And we're, we're just, we have a lot to learn in that scale. We didn't, we didn't get that far yet. Yeah, just like everything else, you're going to learn a lot and you'll come out the other end knowing, I mean, see, when I think about when I made my first, like even my first sort of big budget film, I, I was so green, you know, because every level yeah. you go up, you're learning more and it's crazy. But um, yeah. What's your screening schedule at Idlewild and what you, the days and times? Do you know that offhand that you're? you're I do, I do. Yeah, we get in it. We get in Tuesday opening night, and we're at the Rustic at uh, from, in the six to nine block at the Rustic. Oh, great! Um, then Fantastic. we're going to be hanging out and watching everybody else's films for a few days and mm-hmm. having a blast in in town. And then we screen again on Saturday at twelve, also at the Rustic. Oh, sweet. Yeah. And I'm glad you said that about a filmmaker's film festival, because that's what we pride ourselves on. And and the same that we've moved that formula over to Scotland as well, our new fil- uh, festival in Scotland. It's just we want the vision there. We're not you know, we want films that look good, that sound good, of course, that have an have a narrative like a movie. But we're not. Yeah, it's for more for us. It's more about let's build the camaraderie, and it's amazing that the uh, connections yeah. that people make at Idlewild. It's people go off and they're making films together, and you know, within six months, so it's really cool. It's a good. Yeah, yeah. no, I've been so inspired by that. I mean, again, we've just been to three festivals so far, but I, I'm shocked at just the level of love and support and camaraderie and, yeah. and inspiration that's coming out of just these gatherings and being able to share our films in like a real thoughtful, uh, comprehensive way. It's, it's been incredible. We're, we're so excited to just keep on this path for a while before we have to get all, you know, we have to deal with money and numbers again. Yeah, before you have to be all pro. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Take, sucks all the fun out of it. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again for coming on, Johanna. We're, I really appreciate it. And we're excited to be screening Shutterbugs next week at Idlewild. So, um, Joanna Putnam, everyone. Thanks, Joanna. Thank you. We'll see you soon. All right. See you soon. Up next on the Stephen Savage Show, another of our spotlight directors whose short film Mad Chicken is one of my favorite picks of this 2023 IIFC season. It's quirky and a bit out of left field, but a film I totally got and enjoyed. So I'm happy that this man brought this film to us this year, and I'm happy as well to have him on the podcast. He's an actor and now a director, of course, and I'm happy to have him on. Here is Mr. Mo Irvin. Mo, how are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me on. You're more than welcome. Um, I've been looking forward to this podcast because uh, I have questions. <laughs> 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 so where are you calling in from today? Well, I'm calling from uh, Playa del Rey. I live ah, out here. Nice. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually really beautiful today, mm. uh, despite all the rain that we've been having, but it's actually really gorgeous today. Yeah, I was telling somebody else that I had to make a trip last week from Warner's all the way over to, to Paramount. <laughs> what is that? The May 12, 14 miles and it took me an hour yeah. and a half. To get... <laughs> Just yeah, cause, that'll do it. Because of the rain. That's LA. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was crazy. Um, I've been yeah. starting off the, all of the Spotlight Director interviews this year by asking my guests to give my listeners a little background on you know their trip through the world of indie filmmaking and 
Yeah, so if you wouldn't mind, give us a quick rundown of your career, both as an actor, of course, appearing on some very popular series, and and uh, please tell us what brought you from acting to finally directing. Wow. Well, I think I think you know, directing is is a pretty it's a pretty natural trajectory mm-hmm. from being an actor. Um, once you've I've been doing it for a long I've been acting for a long time Mm -hmm. and at at some point you really just kind of want to be able to do your own thing you want to be able to say what you want to say sure um it's uh, I love acting it is it is my first love for sure Mm -hmm. um but um you know there came a time where I just had things that I wanted to say I I think I have a very particular vision and uh and I wanted to put it out there so Mm -hmm. for me it started uh, really back in 2000, I want to say 2011, mm. 2010, 2011, when Robert Rodriguez was having a a fake trailer contest. I believe they were doing the Grindhouse movie at that time. Right, I kind of remember and, that. Yeah, and he was having a, a fake trailer contest, and I had a great idea, and I was like, I want to do this thing. So I pulled some friends together, and we we shot a thing that I... Uh, it, was a, it was a fake trailer. It was called Wacko Jacko. And he was having a contest. And if you won the contest, then your movie got made. But I found out about it too late is what the problem was. But I, I was like, I'm still going to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. And submit it. But the film that actually won was a film called uh, Hobo with a Shotgun. It was a really great fake trailer that they ended up making into a, a feature film with uh, Rutger Hauer. Mm-hmm. But I did one uh, called Wacko Jacko. And it was, uh, <laughs> it was basically about a fake trailer. It was about a, um, a, a guy who was obsessed with Michael Jackson uh, since he was a kid. And, and when Michael died, the guy snaps and uh-huh. he becomes a, a serial killer in, in Michael's image <laughs> and goes after, after the paparazzi who he thinks is responsible for uh, Michael's right. death. So it was just kind of like a dark tongue-in-cheek type of thing and that is my if i have a brand that's the brand is that uh i like that dark tongue-in-cheek type of thing right um so that that was what got me started it only works when you when you have humor like you have humor you know what i mean if you yeah people jump into something oh this is going to be a parody and it's not funny and you go i don't i don't get it but uh, yeah 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 i i'm not i'm not so much into parody as much as i just really like a wink right yeah. that to me is a thing and and it's a really you know the truth of the matter is it's a very fine line mm-hmm. to 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 straddle uh, you know the people that do it well do it really well mm-hmm. but it's a very hard line to straddle but that seems to be the thing that attracts me the most so mm-hmm. that was what i wanted to do with wacko jacko and that really kind of kicked it off for me in, in terms of filmmaking well, it's yeah. you've gotten there because uh, your film Mad Chicken <laughs> is, the, <laughs> is the complete epitome of what we're talking about. It's yeah, every second of the film I got and I enjoyed and I saw where you were going. And sometimes you were going to some really dark places, but it was it's just <laughs> so good. It's just so good. It's like how you you know you you see a film that has vision there's a vision there and a lot of people you know it's not always uh to everyone's taste but yeah at the same time if you worry about that as a filmmaker you'll you'll never get it anything cool done you know yeah you're a thousand percent right i understand that the writer was none other than uh, james whitmore jr who's who's quite the little director in his own right i think it's safe to say (laughs) yeah just a little bit actually i he was he was the executive producer on it i wrote it and directed oh, it. okay, I got it. But okay. he was the executive producer on it, okay. and as a matter of fact, we all we all worked together. Actually, we, we at one point we had formed a theater company together. It was mm-hmm. James and uh, his daughter Alia and uh, her husband Dustin. We we're, we're all really good friends. Who they are and they are in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, so we all did it together. Actually, I wrote it and directed it and cast them, and he executive produced it. James. Mm-hmm. Um, so your yes. collaboration with him started early on before this, right? Early on, way early on, yeah. Mm-hmm. So we we um, we started in the. I started with them uh, doing a play. I met them back in 2008 when we did a a play called um, "Last Days of Judas Iscariot." Oh, great um, title! From Stephen Atley. Great title. Oh, it's an amazing play. Stephen mm-hmm. Atley Gurgis is just you mm-hmm. know an, an incredible playwright. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. We did that play together, and that was how I met them, and we ended up starting 
theater company together and you know it's really one of those things where we kind of do it when we can you know everybody's working mm -hmm. everybody's you know james is off flying here and there and doing mm -hmm. this move, uh, show and that show um do, do you but, find, uh, did you ever find that going to the theater thing is your transition from theater actor to doing a lot of television because television is even a little different than film acting there's such a tight schedule and did you ever sure. did you have to like really um you know sort of discipline yourself to because i've taught at the screen actors guild at conservatory especially i'll meet new sag actors who mm -hmm. have a very extensive background in college or semi-professional theater and then they bring that to the screen and you go oh my god you know i gotta i gotta pipe that down but some people can just <laughs> they can just you know not, you have to tell them you're not trying to hit the 17th row here you know? <laughs> but um, yeah how was your transition into that I, you know, I didn't have a, a my transition wasn't, um, wasn't that major. I mean, mm -hmm. there are things, with, as a matter of fact, it was probably almost the opposite because I came into L.A. and I started in commercials and then oh. went into theater. Right, got it. So I really kind of already had a feeling of what TV was. Mm -hmm. um, and and by, by the way, uh, television was my, uh, I pursued that by design. It wasn't like I kind of fell into it. Like that was my pursuit. It was by design that I wanted mm -hmm. to work in television. So it's ironic that now uh, television is the thing uh, because when I came into it, television was kind of the, the you know, the little cousin of film. You know right, what I right, mean? right. Yeah. Um, but to your point, it wasn't a big transition for me. It is for a lot of actors, particularly those that come from Broadway or whatever. It, it is something that uh, can be difficult mm -hmm. for them to tone it down for, for, the, for the small screen. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't have a problem with it um, at all. And I love them both equally. I actually probably prefer stage more, to mm -hmm. be completely honest. It's just, you know, I mean, you've heard it a million times, man. It's the, it's the idea of just going up every night and, you know, throwing it all on the stage and mm -hmm. not knowing where it's going to go. Um, that thing is, uh, is really beautiful. It's interesting that you have, you know, there's um, it's the big fear, I think, sometimes with actors in, especially in television, but in film, too, is being typecast, you know, and being kind of the handsome guy. You know, I have friends, especially the handsome African-American man. Let's cast yeah. him in. The, I've, um, the late Christoph St. John was such a good friend of mine and the festival. Oh, right and he was yeah. he was on our first grand jury. And then, of course, my great friend uh, Wolfgang Bodison, who I've done three films with. He's just awesome. Wow. But I've talked, I know Wolf. Yeah, Wolf is a great guy, but he's done the same thing. He's really gotten into directing stage yeah. at uh, Playhouse West, but but they both told me the same exact thing. It was like, you know, dude, come on, I can stretch here, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's probably the same for every single actor, but you know, when you, you know, you're you're the good-looking guy and you <laughs> <laughs> it's like right. they're not they're afraid that they can't ask you to stretch it all they just you know so i don't know if that was a problem for you ever but. well it's interesting you say that man i it, my coach told me my my acting teacher years ago uh when i was training in class he told me <clears throat> you're gonna hit a point where you're gonna get typecast and it's not mm -hmm. a bad thing it's mm -hmm. it's gonna be what it what you're gonna be known for and i'm in that currently right now right the difference is I think you kind of have to think about it in a way that says, okay, this is what I do. And then you're going to have to, you're going to have to make, because it's not a bad situation to be in. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. It's a good, it is, pro you know a good I mean? problem to have. It's a good problem <laughs> to have, but you, you yourself are going to have to make people see you in a different way. Hence, Wacko Jacko, hence mm. Mad Chicken, um, because I play the chef in it. And I, it's just an idea. It's just a, a way to show people that I do different things, that I'm not just a, one trick pony mm -hmm. my my kind of wheelhouse on television is usually i'm playing like a highbrow uh police chief or, right, a, or right. a, you know a general or you know something right. of, of that you know very Z denzel type stuff right um but my love is really creating characters and mm -hmm. so uh, i'm able to do that in voiceover and i'm able to do that kind of on my own but there is a wheelhouse and i would say I, i've been typecast but I don't, I don't mind it you know it's 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 what it is until it's not yeah and it's it's also well i've found and you're probably the same type of 
actor. We'll get back into your directing in a minute, but I'm always <laughs> fascinated to talk with actors. But um, I did a film with Wolfgang Bodice and was a Western. I've done a few Westerns and and mm-hmm. I got Wolf for a lot less than his day rate <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> I, I he wanted to play a cowboy. He wanted to ride and shoot and do all that stuff. So I got him yeah. for, I don't like to say I got him for super cheap, but I got him for less than he came on and gave me three days just yeah. because of that. And I don't know if you've if you've taken on roles in, as an actor just because it's something different and away from the norm that you, that you're asked to play. Oh, for sure, for sure. And those it, it, to your point of uh, being able to get it, which you, an actor just wants to do what they do. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So a lot of times, if you as a filmmaker, you, you, I wouldn't be afraid to ask you know a bigger name mm-hmm. for something because you just don't know if that's what they want. They want to just do something that right. is outside of what they normally do. Right. So a lot right. of times. Uh, will certainly take something for a lot cheaper just to be able to stretch and mm-hmm. do something completely different. So yeah, what one thousand percent, man. Yeah, that's 1, what I, I tell my directing students at AFI in the past. I've said, you know, don't be afraid to ask somebody you think they're out of your league, but you offer yeah. them something. Then don't offer them that, you know, one actor has played uh, the uh, the same lawyer three times in a row. Don't bring a lawyer role to them if you really want yeah, somebody. Yeah, exactly. You know, so that's, yeah, that's one of those things that works, I think, really well. But um, yeah. but back to your directing, um, I just think your style is very cool. I don't know how if the love of directing is now something that's just like it does for most of us, gets you by the collar and pulls you in. But um, are you planning on doing a lot more? <laughs> you know, I'd like to, but you know, it's not a, it's not a cheap endeavor. Um, <laughs> it's not yeah. a cheap endeavor, but yes, the, the, the short answer is yes. I'd love to, man. I, I have some, some things that I'm working on now, but because of the way that I, I see things, it always ends up being more visually, um, it, it, it's, there's always a lot of, because my, the people that I really look up to are like the Guillermo del Toro, oh, right, yeah. the Robert Rodriguez, it's the people that are just very visual. Um, and so I find that the stuff that I like to do, and it's just how it comes out of my head. Man. Mm. Um, but I for sure want to do more. I've never done a feature, so I'm, I'm working up to that. Mm-hmm. I have one more short that I want to do, uh, mm-hmm. before I do a feature, but, um, I just, you know, I'm just one of those people that likes a lot of eye candy. <laughs> <laughs> right. I just do. Yeah. You know, some people say it's, you know, you know, it could be less in the movie or whatever. But for me, it doesn't. I mean, I feel like if you have a, like, for instance, I just saw uh, Blonde and I, I, I was just blown away at the visual style. Right. Uh, in that movie, it just was so gorgeous for such a, a, re, a, a film set in reality. Uh, but the the visual style of it was just amazing, and I love that. I love when people come up with really quirky ways to look at things. So, right. um, well, you're that's what what, I, mad. Do. Mad chicken is definitely a different way to look at things. But <laughs> I think I don't want to pull people away and act like it's so quirky that it's not enjoyable. I mean, most people will get it. Will get where you're coming yeah. from. It it is dark, but there are people who just aren't into dark sort of films aren't are they're never going to be into it no matter what you do so yeah you know yeah. you just have to keep make, making films for the rest of us who eat that stuff up <laughs> yeah man you know what listen this it's art man yeah. you got to just do what you do and throw it on the wall yeah. it's going to land with who it lands with it may it, who it doesn't it just doesn't i mean mm-hmm. there are a million great filmmakers who've made films that it just didn't land right it just didn't land it doesn't make them less a filmmaker but the, for whatever reason, it just didn't land. But mm-hmm. that is never going to stop me from trying something. I have to try it. There's know? a million things that can go wrong in a film. There's a million yeah. things that can make it less than what the director's vision was, you know? Oh, for sure. It's, so you just have to suck it up. And at the end of the day, you have to release it into the world. And that's what it is. And uh, yeah. I had this thing for a while, especially just at the beginning of COVID and thing. You know, I was doing a lot of commercials and on set was <laughs> weird, man. It was just strange. And you had these non-filmmakers yelling at people about their masks. And, you know, I'd have uh-huh. to come to their rescue. There's a guy pulling focus and he has to lip, put his mask down because he wears glasses. 
<laughs> they were fogging yeah. up, and and the lady came over and yelled at him, and I'm like, geez, get the, get off his back, man, you know. Yeah. But but I ran into this thing about you know we were talking about the the overall aesthetic of a project, and even in commercials, I'm used to working with really pretty people. And no matter what their race is, I'm into yeah. work. I'm I like looking at pretty people, and so sure. I I've taken flack in the past for, you know, I've cast a lot of really good looking women, especially, <laughs> and uh-huh. uh, and uh, why don't you get more real looking women? Well, you can make a movie just as easily with with good looking people, but you I I, I kind of understand, I guess, but it's not going to change me. But the the fact is that. You know, you get a you get producers who get onto this weird kick about what what you have to be making, and you know, you you need people who are you know, like commercial work, and they're bringing models, supposed models, on who are you know, I don't want to fat shame anyone. They're not models. They're not in good shape. They, mm-hmm. it's like you know, hit the gym before you take the job. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, it's a funny thing dealing with uh, dealing with more of a higher end thing, like you're talking about going to features. Mm-hmm. But to make your own movie in your own way without anybody on your back about little crapola, you know, and I yeah. think I think that's what's drawing you into directing is because you just did Mad Chicken, which is your it's completely yours, yours, your stamps all over it. But I just want to say when you get into bigger budget stuff, get ready, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a ride. So I hope Well, you... I mean, this is why we do the shorts, so that yeah. by the time you do your feature, you you've got it under the bag, you know what I mean? Yeah, you, but but there are know. things you have to there are things you'll <laughs> that'll come knocking on your door that will surprise you because when people are yeah, I'm only saying this because I'm going through this thing right now where, you know, the uh, more the more zeros behind the project, the more people trying to justify their jobs and telling you things yeah. it's like, oh my god so well, I, that's a fact. Yeah, yeah i think that your uh that your vision is going to go places i think you've got a lot to say and um so yeah i just want to give you a pat on the back and go get ready for the ride because <laughs> people are going to want you to direct you know and there'll be bigger budgets and then you know it's that's when the rodeo starts <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, man, I, I'm one of those guys that uh, I, I've been in it long enough to know that that is hap- that that yeah. happens, and it's right. going to be, you know, especially with people who are dealing with the studio system. I mean, yeah. God, I can't even imagine directing a Marvel movie and, and really just really not being able to, to put your own stamp on it. I mean, you you once you do one of those, you're a cog in the wheel, and you yeah. either have to accept that or you don't. Mm-hmm. But the stuff that I want to do... Um, really is kind of continuing off the beaten path. When I look at somebody like a Guillermo, like mm-hmm. did, when you look at like a movie like Shape of Water, yeah. which is yeah. so raw and visually stunning, um, those are the kind of things that keep me going, mm-hmm. that make me go, it can exist, but you got to be able to do it right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so these short films, you know, they just allow you to, 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 to build on that, on getting it right. Yeah, Ex- you just, experimentation. You have to fail. You, experimentation. You got to do it to 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 do it. Mm-hmm. So, well, uh, those are you. You yeah. brought up um, Del Toro a couple times, and what I find fascinating mm-hmm. about him is that he can. Everything he does is sort of. It's almost like he he tries to stick to this very raw, almost film noir. But then you see him like in the Che Quavera thing that. Mm-hmm. Like, it was almost like documentary style, you know, and yeah. it seems to me he's always experimenting too, even on bigger budgets. He's just one of those guys that's going, this is who I am and I'm going to try different things. And yeah, I, I really respect people like that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when, once you have a command of that, the film language uh, as a director, mm-hmm. I mean, I would imagine that these guys have to keep doing it. It's, 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 you know, I can only liken it to me being an actor and wanting to stretch. So a director mm-hmm. does what he, he becomes known for what he becomes known for. And then yeah. he wants to, to stretch and do something that, uh, that kind of throws everybody for a loop or throw, throws himself for a loop. Mm-hmm. No matter. Mm-hmm. How about, how about screenwriting? Are you, are you looking to do a lot more of that as well? I, you know, yes. Uh, to be one thousand percent, I'm I'm not I'm not in love with screenwriting. <laughs> I do it because I'm good at it, yeah. but I'm not in love with it. That's the truth of the matter. You know, yeah. I mean, the the it it is a writing is a my hat is off to any writer who 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 toils and toils and toils over that script. And so you know, actors have to appreciate 
what it go what goes into that dialogue yeah. for the writer. <laughs> you know, it's Heming, Hemingway said that uh, it's easy to write. You just sit down at the typewriter and bleed because <laughs> it's not my favorite thing. But again, you and I are on the same boat. People tell me, "Man, you write so you know you write great dialogue, and I love your scripts. Could you help me with this?" And I'm like, "It's just really not my favorite thing." But once I'm yeah. uh, once I'm done, I'm really really happy with it so yeah, yeah um anyway well when you when you look at people who love it i'm i'm, 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 I'm like god bless them because writing is not something that i love it's it's kind of it just kind of goes along with the territory mm-hmm. and because i want to do what i want to do i have to write it mm-hmm. um but but it's i wouldn't say it's my first love i'm, I'm working on it i'm working on <laughs> <laughs> I'm working al- on this love relationship. <laughs> you're not alone. What What's your screening <laughs> schedule for Mad Chicken at Idlewild? Do you know your days and times? Uh, Tuesday, uh, the seventh, we screen at 12 p.m. Mm-hmm. and we uh, we at the at the, at the town, rustic at the rustic. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. And then on uh, Saturday, uh, the eleventh, we screen at 6 p.m. at the rustic. Sweet. Yeah, that's so, great. Yeah. Um. I'm just looking forward to to hanging out. So that's the cool thing. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm really excited this year because the crop of filmmakers. It's you know we've had really good films in the past, but the overall crop hasn't been what this year's is for some reason. We just you know we've come into our own as a festival, which means that a lot of really quality filmmakers are bringing their stuff to us now. And it yeah. has you know the fact that the Hollywood Reporter called us the greatest little film festival on earth. At first, I yeah. didn't know what to how to, what to think, and now I realize what they mean by that. You know the camaraderie and and everything. It's definitely a filmmakers uh, film festival. So I'm happy. About yeah, that. yeah. We when we once we told people we were in it, man, everybody was just like, "Oh, it's such a great festival! It's such a great festival!" So I'm mm-hmm. excited, man. I'm excited to see some great films and yeah, I had a, some creative filmmakers. I had a another pitch meeting for something I'm doing for HBO the other, um, with uh, with Eugene Kelly and you know, big time producer and anyway I walk in expecting him to go yeah uh, I've actually seen this movie and he goes oh you're the guy that owns the Idlewell Film Festival and I go that's it that's what you know of my resume and then I thought well it's a good thing it's not a bad thing so yeah, yeah anyway yeah. well thanks again for coming on the podcast Mo I'm excited that you've brought Mad Chicken to Idlewild it's weird it's dark and it's wonderful all at the same time and I'm just, uh, thank you so much I'm just happy to have you so ladies and gentlemen Mo Irvin. Thank you, Mo. Thank you. We've been doing these IIFC uh, 2023 Spotlight Filmmakers, and I've, I've just been enjoying the whole process of, of talking to, uh, to independent filmmakers and, and, and just spending time talking about the passion for their art and as most people who listen to my podcast know it's usually about more sort of well-known actors producers directors but for me this has been a real treat to um well every year it's just nice to talk to uh to the filmmakers who who bring their great movies to our festival and we're we just want everybody to know we're really grateful for that so Anyway, enough of that preamble. <laughs> Today I've got uh, the two Spotlight filmmakers who have brought us a really amazing feature-length doc- documentary that I'm going to be talking about with them right now. And um, it's the title of the film is Being Michelle. And it's so well done that we, we've we talked about it a lot with our committees and and it's one of those things where you find a film once in a while that comes to the to your festival and you look at it and you just say wow how fortunate we are to have this caliber of film especially in the documentary categories because for the first few years of the festival we had a lot of just kind of handheld sort of people going out and doing documentaries calling them documentaries and now with you know the way that say Netflix puts together documentaries that we really look for the sort of filmmaking in our documentary categories that that kind of stands out and this is one of those and that film is being Michelle so I'm going to have the two uh, filmmakers introduce themselves right now now, May, would you please introduce yourself and your husband, who's the director? Yes, my name is May Thornton Mara. I'm producer on the film. 
my husband and director, Atin Mara, is here with me, and we've been working together since about 2009 on social impact documentary filmmaking. Being Michelle is our first completed film, mm-hmm. and um, Atin's here with me. He's the director, producer, and also did the beautiful camera work that you see in the film. So I was we're gonna, thrilled. Yeah, I was going to ask. Here. I was going to ask about the about the cinematography because that's you know it's. It's a tough thing to to be telling a personal story in a documentary and also have your director behind the lens. So attend very very good job, both of you, very good job. But but yeah, Thanks. filmmaking can be difficult, and and then to wear a lot of hats is kind of tricky. But yeah, yeah, good job, you guys, very good job. Well, it's always you know it's all about the you know, the subject, and mm-hmm. also it's about the the person you know you are sharing their story. So it's. For us, it's, you know, we shot this film uh, basically, you know, with the uh, three members, you know. Uh, so it was me and one another uh, camera person with me. She was mm-hmm. local. And then we trained basically Kim's daughter as a sound person, you know. Mm-hmm. So because the reason was, you know, the, the Michelle was, when we met her, she was in very fragile state of mind and, also, you know, she was scared of meeting new people and, you know, she was very shy. Mm-hmm. So, we, you know, so for me, it was, <clears throat> it was more important to, you know, build a relationship and trust and mm-hmm. love uh, with her and care. And I think we, we were able to accomplish those and got good shots because of, you know, how small the team was and it was mm-hmm. more like, you know, uh, very, what you may call, more like family versus, you know, right. just profit. No. Um, and I have to go ahead. shout out our other uh, camera person, same Allison, mm-hmm. um, Allison Larson. She's just been amazing to work with. So yeah. she and Atin a team have quite an amazing communication with one another. And um, yeah, it's their work on the film. Right. Yeah. So May, would you give us just people who have know nothing about the film right now who are going to be seeing? Can you give us just without giving away too much, but just give us basically what the film is about from you know a producer's perspective? Just tell us what the film is. Yeah. So uh, Michelle is was born deaf and she has autism, and she grew up in North Central Florida. Um, she spent time in one of the worst female state prisons in the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she never should have been there. She spent about five years in, in Florida state prison. Mm-hmm. Um, what we learned in making her story is that her very powerful story represents a large population of people in our country and we believe around the world. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, I believe that anybody who watches the film learn so much and all of us need to come together to change mm. the system to better support everyone especially people who are deaf and right. deaf and disabled right i mean when when you hear stories you know from the time we're kids we hear about um we hear about uh, you know uh, people like helen keller and it's those stories are so uplifting but to go through what michelle has gone through that's that puts a whole nother spin on this this you know the um disabled people or in general um what what people go through in life and some people have horrific stories that make helen keller's look like a a a cinderella story you know basically yeah well and you know we we can tell you it's been um an honor in our lifetime to work with michelle Mm -hmm. to tell her story she plays a major role in the filmmaking process itself and that's what you know i think everybody loves to see who watches the film Mm -hmm. um But she's an inspiration to all of us. You know, she's been through so much, and yet um, the smile on her face and the laughter when she's, you know, making jokes or Mm -hmm. playing jokes on a tin, throwing spiders on them in the in the (laughs) jungles of (laughs) Mm -hmm. North Central Florida. um, You know, we just we've had such an amazing time getting to know Michelle, and she's really an inspiration to all of us. Right. Um, I, I've been starting off these interviews by, you know, I'll start with a 10 because you know, he's the director and then uh, uh, may I'll be going to you about the same question, basically. But I've been allowing my audience to get to know the filmmakers a little bit because, through their backgrounds, you know, and uh, before jumping into more detail about the film itself. A 10, would you mind giving us a quick rundown of your filmmaking career and life and how that all became, you know, what basically possessed you to start writing and directing for film? And then, May, if you don't mind, I'll be asking you the same thing. 
Well, the first thing, you know, I didn't know that I'll be become the film banker, you mm-hmm. know, was it was just the uh, universe put me into that spot and I liked it and, you know, and mm-hmm. I become, you know, and storytelling was very, uh, it was, I think, the one of the most important tool that I felt was telling your own story helps you so much. Mm-hmm. Imagine if the world hears your story, in, 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 you know, it's not only the people they don't go through the traumas or uh, problems and issues is to the people you know basically struggling and trying to find friends so story i think it helps you and you know s- somehow connects you with the you know uh, mm-hmm. the issue uh, but you know growing up i was you know i came here uh, you know we married uh, uh, almost 18 years now and you know i came in this country you know like yeah 18 years ago and I grew up in in India in a small town called Varanasi. Uh, kind of a small kind town. of a small town. <laughs> yeah, but it, it was a small, and that time when we grew up, now it's huge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But in, so, grow up in and you know, growing up and you know, uh, went through a lot of my own issues, and especially my you know family dramas and stuff, and you know, very t- uh, you know, kind of interesting, ch- uh, uh, t- interesting and tough childhood. Mm-hmm. You know, but and. I feel like the, you know, uh, I don't know what to do. And I was in, you know, between light and dark place and trying to, you know, uh, figure out which direction I want to go. And mm-hmm. someone, a friend of mine brought a camera in my life, you know, oh, right. and he, he just gave it to me and he says, this is a camera, it was a film camera and this is where you take photos. And, and I, I took photos, uh, after he taught me, I took some photos and, you know, I was like, whatever, you know, I don't know photography, what that mean, you know, taking photos of some strange person. Mm-hmm. And, and he came back from, uh, 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 he went to see his family, he came back and he took the camera and, you know, he, uh, washed the rolls and, uh, when the photos, they came out, he says, listen, I need to talk to you. I was like, what? He says, I've been doing learning photography for the last three years. And you just took in two weeks, and <laughs> I can't. He said I can't believe that you know you have such a great eyes, and right. you need to keep doing this. You know, mm-hmm. so I think that was a, basically the reason was you know like the uh, I felt like you know whatever uh, the anger, the frustration, and you know, mm-hmm. and as as a young you know uh, you know you can call a kid a man, you know, grown up mm-hmm. man is you know. All the stuff I build up for whole life, I just focus on on to the photography, you know. Mm-hmm, yeah. And that become, I think, the photography gave me the tool. It's almost like you know meditation, you know. Mm-hmm. So, and I think that's where my journey began. And you know, and then slowly, slowly, I felt like the moving images are more powerful because it's e- easy to communicate with people mm-hmm. and have larger. Uh, crowd then I move into the you know documentary world and a documentary world I really love because I feel like since uh, I went through so much in my life and uh, especially my mom and stuff and I felt like the one thing I was always as a man in that society I was being held by my own people that not to share my own story mm-hmm. and because you're a man you should be tough and strong and I think uh, that's where I felt like the you know telling a story is the most important thing Mm-hmm. Well, it's it, one thing I find amazing is people who I know so many filmmakers who came from photography. That was their first love of the visual. And um, it, it's not a surprise to me, though, because uh, the movie, the movie has an intimacy to it. And, a, and, a, and I, I, I kind of almost want to say that there's it's it brings people in documentaries sometimes you you're looking from the outside everything is so on the outside but maybe it's the subject matter maybe it's you know whatever it is you you as a director and you may as a producer have been able to really drop us into Michelle's world in a way that you know you don't like especially some bigger budget documentaries are a little too detached and you feel like you're watching what they call murder porn, you know, like the what what's on TV about, you know, this murder in the Ozarks and all that stuff. But <laughs> when it comes to uh, when it comes to documentary filmmaking, a story like Michelle's needs to be so personal, not just in, you know, the telling of the story, but but just the visual as well you know there are moments in the film that you just your heart is just grabbed and it's almost like it's kicked through the dirt a little bit you know but to bring us to a place where it's 
where there's redemption in ourselves. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, I just really, I just really want to commend you guys with that. But for that, but May, were you making movies when you met a ten, or were you were did you guys kind of you know fall into that together? Yeah. So I um, I was born and raised here in the United States. Grew mm-hmm. up moving around quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was studying in India for about a year when I met a tin mm-hmm. and the, the rest was his, is history. <laughs> <laughs> um, I kind of my own academic background and, you know, I've done a lot of things in life, but I um, I love oral history. I studied, you know, the languages and history of South Asia. Mm-hmm. Um, we have another project we've been working on together since 2009 that takes place in central India. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, for me, I bring a different set of skills, obviously attends behind the camera. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's the technical one, but for me, you know, I really kind of see what our story is and then I figure out how we're going to build it out and mm-hmm. how we're going to connect this to, um, you know, to the larger systems. And, you know, with Michelle's story, I mean, we had no idea when we first met her, we, we couldn't believe her story and we knew we had to work with her to tell it, mm-hmm. but we had no idea at that point that she represents a, a large population of people dealing with similar issues. And, you know, the basic human right to communication, I'd say is one of the lesser discussed human rights, but, um, it is very important. <laughs> yeah. And I think that we as a society have so much to understand um, and, you know, so much more support mm. needs to be there for um, the deaf community, especially, and, you know, the disability community mm. in general. And I think, you know, more and more there, there are changes happening, but a story like Michelle's is just so educational and so powerful for all of us to um, come together and see where changes need to be made. So, have you guys thought about dramatic narrative? Has that ever come up to where maybe you would step out of the documentary filmmaker role and into more narrative? Yeah, you know, um, we tend to work on challenging stories. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes we look at each other and a tin says, this is the last time we're doing such a hard <laughs> <laughs> hard project. But, you know, then he falls into the, another one and there yeah. we are. We have a few other um, documentary films in progress. We... We'd love to. We have a couple of stories um, yeah. in India that we'd love to film one day. Um, because from my we'll point see. of view, from my point of view, Michelle would be a great movie. Movie. Does that make sense? It's just. Absolutely. It's yeah. just. Uh, it just lends itself to a great feature film. <laughs> so it's just me yeah. talking. But you know. Um, but yeah, I'm. I'm glad because the filmmaking is so. I don't know. Michelle being Michelle is. It, it it just has a, an almost narrative feel about it. It's documentary, but yet you feel like you want maybe more of the story even. And that, and that brings us to the point of where, how did you guys get involved with Michelle in the first place? What did that, when did she kind of come into your life? Well, uh, I was uh, working in India, I came back and I had a friend of mine who told me about Michelle and, you know, and so, you know, I was like, you know, well, uh, he said, you know, you don't have a choice. I already bought a flight ticket. We need to go see this person. Mm-hmm. You know, I said, oh, well, you know, I just want to wait for another documentary. I'm working already in one and it's taking forever. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, like since he was so, you know, it was like he already bought a ticket. He says, my wife is out of town and this will be fun for us to go just. And so we went there and we <laughs> saw her for a little bit. I met Kim. You know, still she was very shy. So, mm-hmm. you know, the first time I was like, you know, she needs a space. She just, you know, uh, uh, let's see. So we left basically to meet uh, part of Kim's family uh, into uh, a different city. And that's where uh, we got called, uh, you know, that Michelle is missing. Mm-hmm. And that's the first thing we ever shot, you know, and oh. that in the film. And you see that, you know, you're going to see it once, you know. Right. Uh, but you know that was the basically hook and uh, for the film that there's something you know there's a reason universe brought me here and and uh, uh, there's something very you know very powerful about it about her especially you know and despite whatever happened to her you know um, you know God never you know and never anyone will go through what she went through but at the same time it's like how strong she is mm-hmm. that. Like it's it's so, so powerful to see that girl that you know what she went through, but still she laughs and smiles and you know she's yeah. you know sounds like a little kid you know. 
And I, I have to say, she's she's pretty fortunate too. I mean, it's a weird thing to say with her background, but she's fortunate that you guys came upon her as well because somebody needed to tell that story. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, if it weren't for, we met her when she'd been about a year out of prison. Mm -hmm. If it weren't for her happening, you know, happening to meet Kim and Bob and their guide dog in prison that day, you know, Mm -hmm. we're not sure that Michelle would be here and that we ever would have been able to met her. So, you know, them stepping in when they did and supporting a fellow human being and us coming along when we did and, Mm -hmm. you know, being to work with Michelle to tell her story, you know, it's, um, we we both i feel like we all needed each other you know because yeah, yeah. the reason is like you know i'm being you know i never like living in you know like la or you know before we were in new york city you don't you don't hear even in news media and other places you don't hear stories like that you know mm-hmm. lived there years never heard any stories you know and I, for my my question was when i met her and i heard her uh, uh you know story i was in shock basically mm-hmm. So for us as, as a human being, it's the first thing is, is, is you know, how we going to make and not, I'm here now, I'm not in India, I have a, we have a daughter, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. how we going to make, you know, safer place for our, you know, for kids, our, for their future, basically. Right. So, you know, if we never, and I do believe the camera has, is so powerful, such a powerful tool, if you use it in the right way, you right. know. And then it's with any tool, but the camera itself, I felt like if we didn't have a camera, I will say, I can say definitely the camera really helped mm. her life. Otherwise, she will, you know, this she will never get out of that situation. Right. Well, we brought on um, several advisors to the film, um, both deaf and hearing advocates who've been working on some of these issues and doing research and, you know, working with these communities. And um, a couple of them actually in 2021 published a book called Deaf People in the Criminal Justice System. Mm -hmm. And it's the first conglomeration of research done on this population. There's very little research done. There's not much known about, you know, Mm -hmm. people do what Michelle dealt with, but um, they're working with us to create supplemental educational materials. And, you know, for them to have a film that, coincides with what what their own research is and what they've been trying to you know educate about it's it's a really powerful collaboration so we're just really excited to see where this all continues to um you know ripple out and bring changes yeah. that need to happen it's important then, go yeah. ahead and then, so, you know, it's like it's not only us it's so many people behind this film you know so mm-hmm. many people they really worked hard mm-hmm. from editors to the sound person to the colorist and everyone put their heart inside in this film that's why i feel like you know we were able to accomplish, you know. Mm-hmm. It's not you know, only me and me. It's just so many other people behind us. You guys brought something up very, very important and interesting, but you were talking about big cities. And, you know, I found, because in Idlewild, there there are a couple of men who are, who are uh, sort of mentally disabled. And I think in big cities, these these people get lost. Whereas mm-hmm. in a small town, like Idlewild has embraced these two gentlemen. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, oh, there's Tim. Or Tim used to wear tuxedos all the time. He'd get up and dress in a tuxedo and go into town. So he became mm-hmm. known as Tuxedo Tim. But he wasn't mm-hmm. outcast. It was like you'd see Tim and every, I found that that guy is so popular in town. Everybody knows him. Everyone says hi to him. And in a big city, I don't think that the, the opportunity for that is quite as as evident. And, you know, you guys have brought brought Michelle into your own sort of community, filmmaking community or educational community. And that's, um, yeah, it's it's hard to, the homeless situations in big cities or people are just forgotten and it's really sad. And I think you guys have, have put a spotlight on something very, very important. Yeah, and we really believe, you know, there are um, a few states are doing well to provide programs for people who are deaf and have an additional disability. Mm-hmm. Um, We have one advisor on the film who's been working with a community up in Northern California. And, you know, we really are going to use her experiences and highlight the the programs that are doing well and are doing right. I mean, these programs need to be all across the country. Mm -hmm. Resources and support like that is not in North Central Florida where Mm -hmm. Michelle is, and it should be. So these are changes and um, things that we really believe will be inspired by Michelle's story. Yeah. Well, let's get into a more practical thing where, <laughs> concerning Idlewild. Where the film is screened before, right? Idlewild's not your premiere. 
Yes, we had our world premiere at Big Sky Documentary Film Festival, uh, February 2022. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're, we've been on the festival circuit, but we're very excited. Neither of us have ever been up to Idlewild, um, so we're excited to come see some snow and screen at the Rustic on yeah, Friday night. Yeah, it's such a sweet little <laughs> town, and there will be snow, but everything's going to be sunny, and the roads, of course, are already cleared out. They do such a great job. You know, it's my house is, is the exception, one of the exceptions, because I've still got <laughs> two, three cars buried. You know, oh, I, no. <laughs> yeah, so I have, my, I have another car that was parked on the street and I was able to get it but you know towed out but my driveway's a nightmare and so um anyway we'll deal with it later but Idlewild's going to be really nice and sunny and it'll be warmer temperature it'll still be it'll still be chilly enough where people will want to wear coats and scarves but but it won't be sub sub uh, arctic you know <laughs> anything like that <laughs> um what's your do you know offhand your screening schedule at, I, at Idlewild the days and times that you're slotted for yeah, we're screening on Friday, March 10th at 6 p.m. And that's at the Rustic, I mean, yeah, at the Rustic Theater. Yep, at the Rustic ah, Theater. Great. Right. And then are you guys going to be there for the award ceremony? We will be. We're going to spend the weekend there. We have a friend who's putting us up in a little cabin, and mm-hmm. we're excited. But for the weekend, we have um, a couple of our other team members, our executive producer, Delbert Wetter, who will mm-hmm. be joining us, and one of our advisors, Lisa Gonzalez. So, oh, fantastic. And, and of we're, course, our daughter, ahead. Lope there oh that's great <laughs> what the what um i'm looking right here over some email. oh okay yeah so we it looks like we have lined up a couple of people who are going to be uh yep it looks like a couple of people who have volunteered to do um the signing for both the uh both the q a for the screening and at the award ceremony so that's oh, nice that's yeah awesome great uh, yeah that makes me happy it just uh I dig stuff like that, man. <laughs> you know, just like let's include everybody. It's really nice. Um, yeah. So again, thanks you guys at Ten and May for coming on the podcast, and thank you so much for bringing this great documentary um, to the festival. Being Michelle, and I'm so looking forward to uh, to our audience members uh, seeing the film and meeting you guys. And um, yeah, I really appreciate you. Uh, bringing this beautiful movie to Idlewild. Thanks very much. Thank you for having us, and it's great talking with you today, Stephen. All right, we'll talk to you at the festival. Okay, invite. Thank you.